Good morning, Calvary. How are you? Good. A little housekeeping. If you could, if you have a few seats, move in. We have some people who are coming in and need space. There is space around us, but there are in pockets of one and two today, and so we need to make room for those who are coming in. Um, I want to give you an update on the Worship Pastor Search. It's the place and the time we've gotten really real. We're, we're down to a few candidates, and we're having some very serious conversations with them and their families. They're all married. And I just want to encourage you, we're not going to share more than that right now, but it's just a really important time to pray. A lot of important decisions, some life-changing decisions are being made for some people. And would you just pray for wisdom for our team that's assembled together? There's four of us on the search team. And a reminder to just to be praying for the, the, the people we're interviewing and the process as it goes forward. And you probably won't hear anything else from us for a few weeks. But just know that it, a lot of things are happening a lot are go, and it's going very quickly. So if you would be in prayer for that as we go forward. Also wanted today, we do this about once or twice a year, wanted to recognize the deacons that are in the room. Deacons serve the church. They go and do hospital visitation. They help serve the Lord's Supper. They take care of the widows and the orphans in our church. And so if you are an active deacon in this room, I think we have two right now that I see. Would you please stand up? We want to recognize you. John's already standing up, but he's in the back, and there's Drew over there. So if you need something along those lines, those would be two men that you can uh, reach out to. And I'm just going to pray for them and the other deacons in the church. (laughs) Way to squat there, Brandon. Uh, Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time, and I ask that you would be with our deacons. God, as they lead in serving, Father, would you be with them and watch over them? Would you protect them? God, help them to be Uh, Men of integrity, women of integrity, God, as they serve you, serve you with all their hearts. Bless them, God, and help our church um, to be pointed to you through their service. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We are in our middle of our series, and the series is called Expand What You Know. And the idea of expand what you know comes from our vision statement, which says this. Our vision statement is we are followers making followers of Jesus. Followers is the word we use for Christian around here. And you should know that if you have a bulletin folder because it's plastered all over it. All right. Now, from that statement, we have four core values that we talk about all the time. The four core values are followers follow Jesus. In order to be a follower, you got to follow what Jesus says. Another one is Followers give generously. Another one is followers serve God and others. And the last one is followers share what they know. Followers share what they know. This is our idea of evangelism, the idea of you're helping other people to see what you know about Christ. Now, here's the cool thing. You can share just about anything you know. Here's the difficult thing. You can't share what you don't know. So this year we have sub-themes, and our sub-themes for the year 2016 is expand what you know and expand where you go. It rhymes. It really, really works well. So as you expand your knowledge of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, you will have more to share, and you will want to go out into the world and share it with more people. So can we say that together? Expand what you? Expand where you? Good. We got it. Easy peasy. We're all done. See ya. Okay, no. And so this idea of followers share what they know. We're we're diving into it. And last week, Trevor set up the series by talking about everyone has a story and to know the story of what God is doing in your life. And this week, we're tying it into this, this truth that we all struggle with at some level and at some point in your life. And that's this. How do I know God's word is true? How do I know God's word is true? I want you to be able to know this. This is a doctrinal kind of message so that when you go and when you share, when followers share what they know, you can articulate why do I, I don't know why it's true, it just is. That's the answer sometimes we give. I want you to be able to come up with some articulate answers and I hope and my prayer is in through this sermon, it's not just how you share it, but you'll begin to really make this a part of your deep-rooted belief system as you grow in your faith. I know in this service, there are a lot of new Christians And you're growing in your faith. And so I want you to understand why we hold this scripture and why we hold God's word as so valuable and true in our life. When I was a little boy, our church did something called Bible drill. If you don't know what Bible drill is, it was back when they they gave kids an enormous amount of scriptures and told them to memorize it because they were young and they could do it, right? And so we would memorize lots and lots and lots of scriptures. And then we would have our Bibles and we would go out. And one of the things they would do is they would have us find like a book in the Bible. So we'd go find the book of Hebrews and you would have to turn to the book of Hebrews and find it. When you find it, you'd step out and then you'd have to say the book before Hebrews and the book 
after Hebrews. And, and that was really important because no one ever imagined a time when they would have their phones on the iPads and iPhones and you would not need to know the order of the Bible. So that was very important at that time. But one of the things I learned through that was really the importance of God's scripture in hiding it in my heart. Parents, one of the greatest things you can do for your kids is to challenge your kids to memorize a scripture verse a week. It will change them and they can, they can learn it. And here's a little uh, inclination, uh, a clue, memorize it with them so that you as a family can grow. But when you memorize these scriptures and some of your kids are going, oh, I don't really want to do that. Why did the pastor just say that? And, and maybe kids, what I would say to you is maybe you could talk your parents into an incentive like Chuck E. Cheese. I don't know. But when you do this, it, as you try to, uh, your parents are hating me now. And as you try to understand these scriptures and, and hide them in your word, uh, in your heart, God's word in your heart, what you'll find is it changes who you are because God's word is true. And I did that as a little kid and I, I hid those words in my heart. And as I, I grew up, I began to, to realize how what I believed about God's word changed me. And as I grew up, I began to ask this question. Why do I believe this? Why do I believe God's word is really true? If, if I'd have grown up in a Muslim family, they have scriptures, right? Would I, would I believe that their word is true? That that scripture is true? If I'd have grown up in another faith that has their scriptures, why is the Bible's scripture, God's word, true? That's an honest question. And if you've never been asked that, then you never probably shared the gospel with someone who's of a different faith or a different belief system. And, and I hope we can dive into that some today. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews is not the name of a coffee shop. It is a book in the New Testament, Hebrews. Some of you will get it later. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn with the Hebrews chapter 4, and we'll begin by reading in verses 12 through 13. Some of you are shaking my head. I've been here for 30 months. You should know my humor by now. Um, 4, verses 12 through 13, here's what it says. For the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of the soul and the spirit joints and marrow. It is able to judge the ideas and the thoughts of the heart. No creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Let's read that again. For the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the ideas and the thoughts of the heart. And no creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And some of you are sitting there going, see, it says the word of the God. We can trust that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. And, and, and sometimes I remember memorizing these verses. And then some of you who are good debaters and some of you who really believe God's word will come back to me because this is what they teach you in philosophy. This is what they teach you in debate class. Yes, but you can't use the scripture to defend that the scripture is God's word. Anybody ever heard that argument? To which I would say, you're absolutely correct. And I had a philosophy of religion class in college. And the final was, prove God's word is true. Don't use the scripture. That was a difficult final. That was the entire final. It was one question. We had to write for an hour and a half. If you got up early, you failed. True story. Okay? So that was the final. We're not going to do that today. But one of the reasons I think that we can use this scripture to authenticate the fact that God's word is true is by first defining what God's word is. Because you see, when I say the word of God, most of you probably think of a book. And while this is God's word, as it says in Psalms 119 or 109, well, I forgot for a moment. Somebody can correct me later. I'm on the stage. I'm nervous. Okay. It says this, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Your word, God, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And that clearly refers back to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books, the Pentateuch, the, the Torah, the law. And what he was saying in that scripture was, your word, God, should direct my path. We can trust it. We can believe in it. And therefore, we know that God's word is the word of God, the scripture. But do you realize the word of God is so much more than just the scripture? Some of you, that sounds awful to say. But how do I know that? In John 1.1, 1, 1, it says this. 
And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. If the word became flesh, I don't think this is going to become flesh and dwell among us. Now, I know that, no, no, never mind, that's chasing a rabbit. Now, the word of God became flesh and dwelt amongst us refers to the fact that God sent, the Father sent Jesus down to earth. And he lived and, and he became the word of God. And so if he was the living word of God, how does that refer to the Bible as the word of God? Because the word of God defined isn't just the Bible. The word of God is God's revelation that penetrates into the lives and the hearts of men and women. In other words, the word of God is God revealing himself to you and me. So Jesus kind of revealed who God was because he was God. And so when he spoke, he was kind of speaking as the word of God. And, and then the other aspect of that is we believe this is the word of God because it reveals God's words into our lives. I don't know about you, but I rarely, if ever, have heard God speak to me in an audible voice. Daniel, go do this. It just doesn't happen. But when God speaks to me through his scripture, he is speaking into my life and giving me, and it is the voice of God. Now, how do we know that this is authentic? How do we know that this is actually the word of God? Because we believe this is God's inerrant, infallible word as he intended it for our lives to receive that will guide and direct our lives. How do we know? Well, I'm gonna do something I hardly ever, ever do and give you five points today. And each one is 22 minutes long. I'm just kidding. As we dive into these five points of why we can trust that God's word from this scripture, and here's the first one. It says in verse 12, for the word of God is living and effective. The idea of living and effective is the idea of it's active, it's knowable. So the first way that I believe that we can know that God's word is truth is because it is knowable. God's word is knowable. How do you know it's knowable? Well, it's a relationship. What you're really trying to have is a relationship with God because what separates us from the other faiths, the other religions, is that we are called to have a relationship with God. He is knowable. And because he is knowable and he is the word of God, God's word is knowable. And when he speaks to us, he speaks to us in the way that all relationships are spoken to. Some of you have heard me say this before, and so I'm going to repeat it, but I think it ties in and it's an essential to understanding how God's word speaks if you're going to have any relationship, there are three intimate levels of intimacy that every relationship must have outside of the spiritual intimacy. And the first one is the intellectual intimacy. The second one is emotional intimacy. And the third is the physical intimacy. Now, physical intimacy, check, is action-oriented, okay? Let's not take it any other place. So there's the action-oriented intimacy, there's the emotional intimacy, and there's the intellectual intimacy. And every single person that walks this earth leans and leads with one of those three levels of intimacy. So when I started dating my now wife, who back then was not my wife because we weren't married yet because I started dating her. When I started dating the woman that I am now married to, here's the way it worked for me because I lean with intellectual intimacy. Some of you are going, yeah, right. And I go, really? I'm just saying, you don't have to be smart to lean with intellectual intimacy. You just have to go with it. And so I saw her and I saw her love for God. And I thought to myself, this would be a great woman to date. Intellectually, it makes sense. And so I started going through the reasons and the logic. And then I thought to myself, yes, I should date her. I should ask her out. And so I did. And then my heart and my actions followed along with that. And some of you are going, that makes total sense. Some of you are going, that is the most unromantic thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> and that's because if you think that's unromantic, because that's not the way you're wired to lead in your level of intimacy. Some of you, it makes perfectly sense that your emotion leads the way. I love her. Why do you love her? I don't even know, but she's just, I just love her. And then as you start dating her and you, you start to go, well, this does make sense. I, this really, she just gives me good fuzzies, and, but the good fuzzies have translated into, it makes logical sense. So I'm gonna carry this out and, and then I'm gonna walk beside her in this life and I'm going to serve her and I'm going to, and so you lead with emotion. Some of you, you don't know you love someone until they bring you a muffin. 
oh my goodness, he brought me a muffin. He must love me. I love this. And because of the action that came first, your heart and your logic came after. Do you understand how that works? It's like, she brought me a muffin. I'm going to bake her cookies or, or I'll buy her cookies because I don't know how to bake. And so this idea, and so you start translating this and it, it starts working out. And so all three of them come together. Now, the reason this is essential is because how you lead in your following of Christ will, will lead in your, the way that you communicate the relationships will lead in how you follow Christ and how you believe God's word is true. If you lead intellectually, you want to know that God's word makes logical sense. It does it? I think it does. And here's how it does. In the history of the world, this is the most popular book that has ever existed. In the history of the book, the facts presented in this Bible have been proven over and over and over and over again. Through all of the history of the world, there is not a singular event that has more documentation, that has more historical evidence than the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It's been intellectually proven. There's intellectually proving the historical facts. There's intellectually proven that all of creation has cried out for a God. All of the creation, if you go to any indigenous tribe, if you go to any indigenous group, and indigenous means, in case you don't know, a group of people who have not yet been associated with outside groups. If you were to walk into a, a culture that has not been with other cultures, you will find a group that is worshiping something, a sun god, a rock. They will be worshiping a, a grandfather, a father. They will be worshiping a stick, the wind, they will be worshiping something because intellectually we're all drawn to worship God. In fact, those who claim to be atheists start first with the trying to deny that natural impulse. I've talked to too many atheists and I've said, haven't you at some point when you, were, you had to talk yourself out of this desire to worship God and the honest atheist almost always says yes because intellectually you are drawn to worship God. Now, when you begin to break this down and when you take this out and you take it to a next level and you begin to articulate the words on the Bible and the words that they're true, you see that every generation after generation after generation has articulated the need and the necessity and the authenticity of this Bible. Therefore, you have generation after generation making a logical case through their actions, through their emotions, through the way they're living their life that says this word is true. Now, what about the other face? Well, the other face would come into the place in the idea that the other face, out of all the religions, out of all the face, this is the only one that really articulates what true relationships are about. Every other faith that has ever existed is about earning your way, earning your way into a right relationship with God, earning your way. But we know that we can't do that. Why? Because we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And even when I follow Jesus, even when I'm following God, I end up falling flat on my face and I, I'm unworthy. But God sent his son Jesus to love us because you were made for him. Doesn't this make logical sense? I have boys. And when they make mistakes or when I make mistakes to them, I don't quit loving them. I don't have to earn my love. I'm, I'm their father. Now, God had a big part of it, but I, I'm part of the creating of their life. Doesn't it make sense that the one who loves you, the one that brought you into this world, loves you right where you are, that would make a system that says you don't have to earn it? The logical arguments compel us. Now, I could spend an hour, two hours on articulating the intellectual argument of why God loves you and why this therefore is true and knowable and good for you. But there's more to the story. So what I wanna do is if this is you, do some exploring, read Case for Christ. Read that book and see the intellectual understanding of why God wants you to know who he is. Case for Christ is the name of the book. There's a symposium that this church sponsors, and they're talking about the intellectual understanding of how we can believe this. It's happening, I think, the first weekend in February. Somebody, is that right? I think that's right. First, there's another member of our church who's the president of an organization called Ratio Christi, the Rational Argument for Christ. I would encourage you to explore those arguments deeper, but there is intellectual understanding to why God is knowable and why his word is true. What about the emotional standpoint? 
Anybody ever been singing and you just feel the presence of God? You read the word of God and the, the hairs on your arms stand up and you, you can't explain it. You may not be the person who can articulate, this makes logical sense, but you know it's like God is sitting in the chair next to you, like his presence is falling on you. It's where Louis Giglio gets the idea of when you're reading the word of God, it's like breath on a page. And I love that. It's, it symbolizes and helps you know that there is a loving creator who is in the presence of where you are and he loves you right where you are. It is an emotional connection. It is a sensation that, that points you to the fact that there is an intellectual serving God and that God is love. What about the action-oriented? What, we've already covered a little of it, but isn't it the action-oriented? There is a man who's the name of Jesus who died on the cross and did the ultimate action. He served you by being a man without sin. He had not made any mistakes and he died on the cross to show you he cared, to pay the price for your sins. The story of the Bible articulates a loving father who was willing to go the extra distance to show you the action that you desperately need is a relationship with him. I don't know who you are, if you're intellectually driven or emotionally driven or action-oriented driven in your intimate relationships, but I can tell you this. God speaks to you through this in the way that you were made and he relates to you because he is a good, good father who loves you. He is knowable and he uses this to make him more knowable. Knowable. I went to a conference last week and I loved it. And it's passion. The conference name of the conference is Passion. It's for college students. It's about God. I know the passion board throws people off, but it's a passion conference about God. And they had six speakers and two of them spoke to the intellectual audience. Two of them spoke to the um, emotional audience and two of them spoke to the action-oriented audience. And I loved it because it's saying that God loves every one of us right where you are. He's a good, good father and he is knowable through his word. Not only is the scripture true because it is knowable, the scripture is true because it points to truth. That may be redundant. The scripture is true because it points to truth. Yes, the scripture is true because it points to truth. Look what it says there. Is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of the soul and the spirit joints and the marrow. The word of the Lord is the sword, Right? I don't know if you ever heard of that. The word of the Lord is the sword. But when I was a little boy, one of the scriptures that I was taught was the Bible is the sword of the Lord. And I was like, that's awesome. And I imagined myself being like Zorro at the time, like, zoop, 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 bah, you know, and I imagined memorizing scripture so I could stab people with it. You know, Facebook wasn't invented yet, but I was going to do it. And Twitter wasn't tweeting, but I was going to do it. I was going to know the scripture so I could use it and arm myself and demons would fall and those who stood in the way of God would fall. And I was going to be a mighty soldier until I realized what this scripture was really about was not stabbing other people. <laughs> Disappointing as it may be. But penetrating me in my nakedness, as it says. In my exposure down to my joints and marrow. You see, when we open the word of God, part of the reason we don't open the word of God is because we know it speaks truth to us. And when it speaks truth to us and our life isn't aligned with it, it hurts. <laughs> I was a little boy, again, I, I have little boy stories today, and I, I was about third grade, and we were at Glorieta, New Mexico. My dad carried a pocket knife, and I wanted a pocket knife because I wanted to be like my dad, and, and I remember asking my dad, Dad, can I carry a pocket knife? And he looked at me, and he said, no, you're too young. And I was like, Dad, this one, let me, let me have this pocket knife. Look, it's, the blade's not even that long, right? Let me, let me carry it, and look, it's not even that sharp. And I... Don't know who bought that pocket knife, but I know I cleaned it off on of my jeans, folded the blade up, and put it back in the bin. It cut me. And I bled. And it was painful. And that's what the word of the God, the word of the Lord does this to us at times. And why would we subject ourselves to this? Because, well, it's not really supposed to be hurting us as much as it is healing us. You see, we're broken, wounded. We went our way and, 
and not God's way. And God uses the word of the Lord as a knife that, that is a surgeon and, and cuts us and, and cuts us open and, and allows us to be healed. I, I used to have a huge um, it would non-cancerous tumor on my finger. And I hated it and I was always embarrassed by it. And, and the surgeon had to go in and cut it out and it was painful. I remember having another surgery on this finger. I don't know why my fingers, I'm just clumsy. And, and I was having a surgery on my finger and I remember waking up from surgery and they said that my first three words out of my mouth were need more drugs. Pain. And sometimes we go, I, I know God's word is true because it cuts, but, but we forget the fact that God cuts us open to heal us, to make us whole again, because the same God who cuts us open is the same God who taught us that the moment I cut myself, the blood cells began coagulating and, and started to scab. This is the God who created the healing system. He created the scabs. He created the idea that your skin would grow back. And I'm not trying to make anyone squeamish, but think about that. He didn't cut us open. When we cut ourselves open, we aren't left to bleed. He is the healer, restorer. And he's so good. And as we dive into God's word and, and the truth hits us, it can hurt. But we know that God's word is true because it does hurt. And as he brings us back into following his wills and his way, we see more of him. God's word is true because it is knowable and it, it points to true and it gives us rest and eternity. Look in Hebrews chapter four, verse one, same chapter, first verse says this, therefore, while the promise to enter his rest remains, let us fear that none of you should miss it. If it gives us rest in eternity, we realize that the rest is the next life, right? Therefore, while the promise to enter his rest remains, let us fear that none of you should miss it. What's that talking about? Well, it's a reflection of Psalms 95, 8 through 11. We're not going to read that right now, but if you want to look it up later, you can. Psalms 95, 8 through 11, which describes a time when God's people were walking in the wilderness. And they were walking in the wilderness because they had been in slavery and while they were in slavery, they were set free and on their way into the promised land, on their way into rest as a nation, on their way into the place where they could be in the will of God, the people started going, eh, this is hard. I don't really want to follow God. I want to do my way. I don't really want to do your way, God. And they complained and God said, well, fine, then don't come to my rest. And that generation died in the desert without ever seeing the promised land. Now, this New Testament author is using it to describe the idea of our rest comes in the next life. And we live our life going through the ups and the downs and the hardships and the struggles and the trials, knowing that our rest is coming. And yes, this life is hard. And yes, sometimes surgery is necessary. Yes, you will get bumps and bruises. And we grieve with those who grieve and we mourn with those who mourn. And we know that life isn't always supposed to be good, but, but we rest in the fact that one day we will be at rest. We rest knowing that our future is secure for those who have a right relationship with Jesus because he becomes knowable. And from there, it takes us to the fourth point, which it not only gives you rest in eternity, but it gives you rest now. Hebrews 4, 9 through 11. Therefore, a Sabbath rest remains for God's people. For the person who has entered his rest has rested from his own works, just as God did from his. Let us then make every enter effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall into the same pattern of disobedience. Therefore, verse 9, a Sabbath rest remains. That's the rest that comes in eternity. But verse 10 says, for the person who has entered his rest has rested from his own works, just as God did from his. 
by trusting in the word of God as God's word, you know what that means? We don't have to earn our way into a relationship with God. In fact, you can't. What it does for you, though, is it affords you the ability to rest in your relationship. Have you ever been in a relationship like that? Best friend, maybe with a parent, maybe with a spouse. You know no matter what you're doing, they're not going anywhere. That's my brother for life. I roomed with my brother in college. You know why? Because we could talk to each other how we wanted to. We weren't nice at all. But part of the reason we love that is because we were sitting there going, well, he's not going anywhere and he's not going anywhere. We're brothers. We're stuck with each other. We rested in that, even in the discord, in the disharmony. We knew we're brothers forever. God is with you forever. And so what we end up doing, sometimes we go to the word of God and we, 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 we listen to this tension that says, okay, I know it's truth. And so Daniel wants to do what Daniel wants to do, but Daniel also wants to do what God wants to do. Daniel doesn't know why he's speaking in third person, but he is. And so Daniel sits there and goes, I want to do this and I want to do that. And I want to do what I want. And yes, I want to be faithful and following God. And so what ends up happening is there's this tension that says, I want two different things, which creates my soul to be at unrest. And the way you alleviate that is you sit there and you go, I have to die to me. And as a follower of Jesus, I'm putting my hope and my trust in God's word, in his provision. I'm putting my hope and my trust in his promises that he has loved me no matter what I've done, no matter where I'm doing, that my works aren't good enough, that I rest in the fact that I will be faithful as best I can, but God's grace will cover me when I fall short and that I rest in this. And what ends up happening is I die to myself more and more. And as I follow Christ more and more, as I lean into his truth, as I lean into his word, I get to be at rest for what I was made to be, a follower of Jesus. Because the ultimate reality of what this book is all about is not intellectual understanding, but an intimate relationship with a good, good father. Yes, absolutely. The Bible, we know it's true because it is knowable. It points to truth and it gives you rest in eternity. It gives you rest now. But the ultimate way we know it's true is because it connects us to God. And people can argue with you all they want about this says that or that says this or this says that, but they can't argue with your experience. And what I've found is the more I dive into these words of God, the more I dive into the scripture, the more I believe them, the more I let it shape me, cut me open, yes, operate on me, the more I say, I don't care what I want to do and I'm not gonna in, in extrapolate Daniel Berry's interpretation. I simply wanna stand before it as I am, unclothed in my natural state and say, God, what do you want for me? I find him. And when I find him, I find a good, good father. So today, as we come to the end, I'm wondering today if you're willing to rest in the word of God. I'm wondering if you can't just dive into this a little more. Next week, we're going to talk about how to read your Bible, to know how to do that. And some of you are going to go, I already know how to read it. Good. Come and help us share with others. We can learn from each other. Invite someone because I think as we dive in this, as we expand what we know, we'll expand where we go and we'll change not only our lives but the lives around us because this is a sword not meant to attack other people but to penetrate into our deepest core of who we are and to take us into the throne and the presence of the Lord. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to this confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is tested in every way as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so we may receive mercy and find grace to help us at the proper time. Expand what you know 
by believing this is true. Expand what you know and let him change you because he truly is a good father. Father, we ask for clarity in our lives, a deeper understanding of who you are, that you would show us more and that we would know you more, that we would see who you are and that we are loved by you. And I know those are the words that we're about to sing, but God, make that our heart cry. Make that our prayer, God. If anybody in this room doesn't know you, God, I, I ask that you help them to see you on the cross and how you showed us through your love, how this makes intellectual sense, how you loved us. And God, how you truly care for us. And God, help us to give our lives to you. And Father, if there's anybody in here, give them the courage to, to share that with someone so that we can begin to articulate with them what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And for all of us, God, may we realize the whole point of why you've given us this wonderful Bible, this wonderful reflection of the word of truth is to connect us with you. So we draw into your presence now. Here we are. Show us we are loved by you. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we sing?